Hi friends, hope you are doing well. I'm Dr. Ganguly. Welcome to my channel. So today I'm going to address a very important issue. This is raised by one of the viewers in the channel. And the question is, how can you do a PhD if you have a long gap? So there are many people out there who may have completed a master's degree, sometime even a bachelor's degree, and they have spent a lot of time working in different companies. Maybe they have been employed in some profession like teacher or nursing, or they may be even somebody who has taken off some time to take care of family and so on. Now, after some time, what happens is that these people think that they can get back into the PhD program. Now, I have seen from my personal experience that this is possible for many people. This is possible not only in your 30s, but also in your 40s. And in fact, I know of one person who was able to do her PhD even at the age of 55. So this was a person who did their PhD in Canada. So let us look at seven different points today about how you can do this particular problem and what are the tasks you can do to increase your chances in terms of doing a PhD at an older age. So now one of the things of course which is very important is that you should make sure that you have some experience in the gap between your master's degree and the PhD. So this can of course be experience in a company, it can be experience in any organization, in the government, in research lab, it could be in some educational institution or college and it could even be in an NGO or as a volunteer. So many people do not realize, for example, people who are taking care of children at home, maybe they are housewives currently, that if they were taking part in some non-governmental organization activities, maybe doing some volunteer work, it may not get paid, but it will help to fill in a gap in their resume. And after a long period of time, they can certainly use their skills because they have developed a lot of skills in terms of managing non-profit type of work. So this is certainly something which is very important nowadays. So let us begin with these seven tips and tip number one is that try for normal universities. So one of the mistakes people often make is that if they have spent a lot of time doing some work in companies and so on, they immediately think that they will get back to a top university. Now, there are cases where this is possible. I had a student once who actually did his master's degree with me and then was working at GE for a long time. And then later he applied to Georgia Tech for a PhD degree in business management and he was able to get admission. But do remember this guy had an exemplary record. He also was working on research and different engineering problems and he also had a very good GMAT score. But in the case of many people, if you do not want to give different competitive exams, which are very difficult and so on, it may be difficult to get into the top universities unless you apply for some fields such as management or some different fields where generalization is actually welcome. So there are a lot of fields where general knowledge, general studies, having done a lot of problems is more important than having spent all your time maybe solving partial differential equations or doing mathematics. Now, one of the aspects about applying to a normal university is that you do not have the competition from a lot of young people who are applying straight after their master's degree. And also many a time professors at normal universities do not often get good and dedicated PhD students. So what happens is that these people may have research problems. Sometimes they may have a lot of grants from the government because Many government bodies actually like to spread out their grants across all kinds of institutions and they may not get diligent students. So this is an opening which you can aspire for. Now, the person I told you about at the age of 55 was able to get their admission and scholarship in a normal university in Canada and do their PhD there. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, the problem number two has to do with finding a good advisor. And of course, a good advisor is something which is necessary for all PhD students, but it is even more important for a somewhat senior PhD student because what you need now is that your advisor should be able to guide you pretty well, should have a baseline problem formulated in his or her head, which he can then give you and then you can basically figure out more aspects from there on. Now, what happens is that many senior professors have some problems sitting on their table and they are often looking for a PhD student to do this problem. So if you are somebody who stumbles on such a supervisor, then your PhD task is going to be 
quite simple because do remember PhD is actually dependent on the problem you are given. If you have to actually spend time discovering your problem and then solving it, that can often take a lot of time. The second aspect is about getting a somewhat senior guide. This is not always necessary, but what happens is that if you yourself are in your 30s or 40s, then it is sometimes easier to work with a person who is at the same age or is at a slightly higher age than you. Now, this is not always necessary, but this does help in some cases, especially in cultures where age is held in higher esteem, for example, in the eastern part of the world. Now, the third way to do this degree is doing something known as the external registrant program. Now, many universities have an external PhD program. So what they do is that they actually enroll PhD students who are not working in the university. So these guys may be working in research labs. They may be working in companies with some research component and so on. They may even be working in the government or in nonprofit sectors. And so what can happen is that they can do their PhD while they are pursuing this work outside the university. Now, very frequently, this person may actually have a co-supervisor from that particular organization who also often has a PhD. And these two guys, the co-supervisor and your guide at the university, get together and they can formulate a problem. So in the external registrant program, you spend some time, maybe a year or so in the university, you take some courses and later you go back to your home institution and you do your research there. Now, sometimes it's very useful to have such a program because there are many situations, especially in national labs, where a lot of good equipment, a lot of experimental facilities are there. And you can combine these with the theoretical knowledge of your PhD supervisor in the university, and you can end up with a good PhD thesis. And one of the advantage of this external registrant program is that you get paid your nice and decent salary while you are working in your organization you do not have to depend on the very less stipend which PhD students often get, which is of course something which is good enough for one person, but it may not be sufficient if you have a family to take care of. Now point number four is something known as the Quality Improvement Program or the QIP. This is also run by many colleges and universities and what happens here is that you get some time off, maybe up to three years to do a PhD. Now, in some cases, you can spend all these three years at the particular university trying to do your PhD, or you may spend maybe one year and then go back to your home institution and teach there. And this kind of program is very useful for many college teachers who are aspiring for a PhD because the PhD will get them some possibilities into getting into higher rank, maybe getting associate professor, full professor grades, maybe becoming department chairman down the road and so on. And also it helps them learn about research because while teaching is important, teaching is necessary, research is something which all universities are trying to do so that their rank goes up. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, of course, the advantage of the QIP program may be that you may get your full salary which you were getting at the college while you are doing this PhD. So this may certainly be much more than the typical PhD stipend, which is just enough to make you get by within the university. Now, the fifth issue is to do with the doctorate. And there is a slight difference between doctorate and PhD. What happens is that many a time a PhD is given only for research work and thesis done at the university. But a doctorate can be given for some cumulative experience which you have garnered over many years. So maybe you are in some field such as nursing, such as business, such as in the higher ed system, in the education system, in psychology and so on where you have done a lot of actual practitioner type of work and you can combine this with some more aspects, some research, and then you can actually write a thesis which can get you a doctorate degree. Now, there are many institutions out there which give a doctorate degree. So do figure out if this doctorate is worth it, if it is legitimate and so on. And after that, you can consider doing this particular degree. Now, one of the advantage of doctorate degrees is that there are many online universities which give the doctorate degree, but do keep in mind that you need to do your research about how this doctorate degree is going to help you. Do not simply do this degree because you want to put a doctor in front of your name. It should actually help you to get some benefit in your job or in your life. Of course, if you are somebody who simply wants to put a doctor in their name, then this is also a good way to go because what can sometimes happen is that if you have been in a field for a long period of time, 
then getting an online doctorate degree is going to add to your resume it's going to get you some respect in your workplace so that is something to keep in mind now the sixth point is a similar thing known as the dsc or the doctor of science now there are some universities and some countries around the world where the dsc degree can be given because you have written a lot of papers in a particular area so maybe you are somebody who has written 10 papers in chemistry or you have written 10 papers in sociology or in Sanskrit or something else. And so what can happen is that you can put together all these papers, you can submit this for a doctor of science degree in certain universities. Now, doctor of science is most often given for the science and technology type of domains, but there may be some universities which actually give it for other domains also. So certainly there are a lot of people out there maybe working in research labs, maybe working in universities, who for some reason did the master's degree but were never able to do the PhD degree and they have actually contributed a lot by publishing papers, doing patents and so on in the field and it is sometimes possible that if you can locate the right university you can get a DSC degree from the university and then you can be a doctor of science and you can put the doctor in front of your name. Finally, the seventh point has to do with looking at different countries around the world. And what often happens is that you may be in a particular country where there are limited opportunities in terms of getting doctorate degrees. The admission procedure is very tough because there are too many people out there applying for a certain number of seats. So what you can do is you can apply globally. So do remember the PhD is a very global thing and you can apply to different countries around the world, figure out different universities, and you may be able to get admission, financial aid, and scholarship to do a PhD in many countries around the world. Now, one of the mistakes which more senior students make is that they apply to the same countries where the young people apply, that is the US, UK, Australia, Canada, and so on. And what happens is that these professors out in these countries, they get a lot of applications, so they can select whoever is the best student in terms of the GPA, in terms of the GRE score. And of course, it's never given explicitly, but it may also be that they like to have relatively younger students who can put in a lot of time in the lab. And many people are comfortable working with younger students, especially assistant professors. Now, what often happens is that there are many universities around the world where you may be able to get admission provided you apply there. Now, do remember that as far as the Asian continent is concerned, there is some age restriction here. But if you apply out of the Asian continent, then there are not many age restrictions. So I know people who have, for example, applied to Mexican universities, Brazilian universities and are doing PhD there. Also, there are people who have applied to some of the parts of the Eastern European system. So for example, you could apply to places such as Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and so on. And there are also people doing PhD in Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and some of the former Soviet republics. Finally, China is also another distinct possibility because Chinese universities are very flush with funding and they may give you an offer, but again, age may be a problem here. But nearby countries which were part of the former Soviet Union may not have some of those age restrictions. So these were some ideas I have for you today. Now, of course, remember, if you are a woman student, there may be certain special scholarships which are out there for you to do PhD. So again, as far as the women PhD students or likely PhD student from India are concerned, I have made a video on that. I'm going to put it on the end screen. And maybe you can figure out more such places where you can do PhD. For example, Fulbright program gives you money to do PhD. There are possibilities of PhD in Japan and so on. So do keep all these opportunities in mind and think locally while you act locally.